Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can see and hear us. I'm assuming that you can. And I also have to start off with an apology, which is I'm sorry about the technical mishap. We had to move from the previous platform um, to this one. Um, uh, uh, we had some technical issues. I mean, the good news is that if NSO Group was secretly waiting on the previous link, we've thrown in the decoy and we're here instead. Um, my name is Paul Lewis. I'm head of investigations at The Guardian. I'll be your chair for the next 60 minutes. So even though we are starting 10 minutes late, we will make sure this session lasts a full hour. Um, we've got lots to talk about in that time. Uh, a quick word before we properly get started. Some of you have sent questions in advance, so thank you for those. Um, if you'd like to put a question forward, then there should be a Q&A tab window in this Zoom that you can use to submit a question. Um, if you're on a tablet or a mobile, you might find that in the Q&A function in the menu. Um, we have had some questions already, and we hope to put those to the panelists. Uh, and let me introduce the panelists. So first off, we've got Stephanie Kirch-Gessner, who's our US investigations correspondent. She is a long time thorn in the side of the NSO group, and she was our lead reporter on the Pegasus project here at The Guardian. We also have Agnes Calamard, who's the new Secretary General of Amnesty International. She was formerly uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur. And uh, lastly, we have Ed Snowden, who really needs no introduction. He's obviously the world's most famous whistleblower he leaked the highly classified documents from the NSA, which was, I think there's no doubt, the most significant surveillance disclosure in history. Um, so thank you all to our panelists for joining us. And I think, Steph, I'm going to kick off with you because you have been intimately involved in reporting this project. Could you just give us an overview, the audience, an overview of the Pegasus project, what it is, how it came together and what its main findings were? Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, so at the heart of the Pegasus project uh, was the leak of tens of thousands of records and the Guardian was one of 17 media organizations that had um, access that could get some eyes on those phone records. Um, this was a project that was organized by a French nonprofit called um, Forbidden Stories, which focuses on the work of journalists who are threatened or killed. Um, and our uh, technical partners who were really critical um, on this project was Amnesty International's uh, security lab, tech lab. Um, so at the heart of this project was, as I said, these records. And what we believe is that these records uh, of phone numbers were individuals who were selected as candidates uh, to be possibly surveilled by clients of NSO group. Uh, we focused a lot on uh, the authoritarian governments who we believe um, were clients. In fact, some of them no longer are clients, and that was one thing that our reporting kind of dug out. Um, but they include Saudi Arabia, Rwanda, uh, the United Arab Emirates, um, and other countries that we believe have abused this technology. Um, some of the key findings um, of our reporting, I should add, actually, not only did, did we have access to these phone numbers, but um, thanks to Amnesty's hard work, we also had forensic examinations of dozens of phones of um, individuals who appeared on the list and who were either, um, it showed infected with Pegasus at some point or were there were attempted infections of Pegasus. Uh, so that's a real critical element of our reporting um, last week on this. Um, some of the names that are included on that list are heads of state, people like Emmanuel Macron. Uh, there are also human rights defenders around the world, lawyers uh, who were had sensitive um, clients, uh, and journalists, um, dozens and dozens of journalists around the world. And Steph, you mentioned infected with Pegasus. I think a lot of people who are tuning in probably have a sense of what Pegasus is, but it's always good to have a reminder. So what exactly is Pegasus, this, this spyware that NSO sells to governments around the world? So Pegasus is, uh, first of all, it's a cyber weapon. And if you, your phone is successfully um, infected with this malware, uh, it basically means that a foreign government a client of NSO has full access to your phone. Uh, it means that they can listen to your phone calls, look at your messages, 
uh, look at your photos. It also means that the encrypt encrypted apps that we all or many of us use to try to protect our privacy uh, are essentially essentially meaningless because the phone is somebody is already inside the phone. So it sort of bypasses the protections of a group like Signal, WhatsApp, or um, Telegram. Uh, the scariest function we always talk about a lot is the fact that it also can, uh, an infection of Pegasus means that somebody can operate remotely the recorder on your phone. So that means uh, your phone becomes a, a digital spy, you know, and can, can overhear conversations or anything going on around you. Great, thanks Steph. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Anya's next um, because uh, I think it'd be useful for people to learn a bit more about sort of Amnesty's role in this. I think a lot of people would not have been aware that you have a, a technical lab that does like advanced forensics on phones and the like. Could, could you just explain a bit more about yeah, how Amnesty came, became involved in this project? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you this evening. Um, the first uh, point I want to say uh, is that Amnesty has been involved a little bit like Stephanie on uh, monitoring and reporting on human rights violations committed by and through NSO for a number of years. So um, this particular Pegasus project is the culmination of, uh, of years of uh, hard work, including at the technical level. Um, the um, Amnesty Tech is um, uh, a group of uh, engineers, a group of uh, technical, um, technically minded people who have spent the last uh, few years just uh, working on the, uh, on the way that particular spyware and others leave traces behind them. And it is on the basis of that work conducted over many years that we have been able to identify the traces, the evidence that a spyware has been um, infiltrated into, uh, into a phone. And um, the, um, my colleagues throughout the last few months and indeed in, in, increasingly now, are actually um, picking up people's phone, those that uh, want to have them monitored, uh, reviewing whether or not those phones have left or are um, under, uh, you know, underscoring or highlighting or leaving behind traces that can only be associated with, um, with Pegasus. Um, you know, it seems very simple. It's a lot of hard work over many years. Those tools that have been developed, the evidence that has been identified in relation to that spyware is not uh, something that uh, a great deal of tech labs can do at the moment. Uh, and I'm very proud that uh, Amnesty is one of those who can do it. And uh, it's an amazing project um, to launch your you know, your, your, your position running Amnesty, I know you're new to the job, but you're not new to NSO Group, as I understand it. And in your previous role as a United Nations Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial judicial killings, you, you came across this company and had a lot to say about it. Could you just tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so as a Special Rapporteur, I investigated the execution of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist, by... Uh, Saudi Arabia, it was a, a state execution plan organized, implemented by and through the state. One uh, particular, particularly crucial instrument, in fact, weapon, that allowed for the targeting of Jamal um, is um, the fact that one of his closest colleague and friend, Omar Ben Aziz, um, was the object of um, technological surveillance and that his phone was compromised using a Pegasus uh, and it was compromised by Saudi Arabia. There is very little doubt in my mind and in the mind of people associated with this investigation that the information that was extracted from uh, Omar Ben Aziz's phone included his um, interaction with Jamal, and we believe that some of that information, particularly related to what uh, uh, Jamal were planning to do, uh, may have triggered 
the decision to uh, to execute him. So, um, and, Pegasus and Pegasus are very central to the killing of, of Jamal, and they were subsequently central to what happened afterwards, because what Pegasus mm -hmm. revealed is that um, days after his execution, four days, no more than that, uh, the phone of his fiance, uh, Atiche saying he was targeted and compromised by, by Pegasus at, a, at a time when she was at her most vulnerable. And, you know, it, it is so um, frankly disgusting what was done to her at that point in time. We also know that um, the, the number of the uh, prosecutor that investigated in Turkey the killing of Jamal Khashoggi was one of those identified um, as a person of interest uh, in, in that list. So yeah. Saudi Arabia continued to use Pegasus to, um, uh, after the murder, to monitor the trial, to monitor first the investigation, to monitor what was going on within the closer circle of, um, of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. So, I, yes. I should say, Anya, thank you for that. Um, NSO group has said, still say that they had absolutely nothing to do with their technology had absolutely nothing to do with uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Obviously, that needs to be squared against the forensic evidence that, um, as you say, was found in phones in the past and has in this latest tranche as part of the Pegasus project. I, I'd like to turn to Ed now, if if I can. Um, don't forget to unmute Ed, just in case you were thinking of uh, staying muted, which would be a disaster for us all. Um, just give us your reactions, will you? I mean, you, you, you obviously know a thing or two about massive surveillance disclosures. What do you think the significance of the Pegasus project is? Well, for a lot of people, uh, they remember surveillance in the context of 2013. Uh, this is the idea uh, that governments are spying on communications as they're in transit across the internet uh, through bulk collection. Um, technical improvements to the way the internet uh, broadly moves networks and websites work uh, and apps today I mean that kind of surveillance is no longer possible with the same ease, the same uh, low level of sophistication uh, due to the spread of encryption. Um, however, uh, the second part of the 2013 story, uh, there were many, uh, that was a, a major thing was the fact that companies were collaborating with governments to go beyond what traditionally we expect which is somebody tapping one, right? Um, and it said everything that you had ever shared with Facebook, anything that you had ever written on Skype, uh, anything you had ever typed into that Google search box uh, was being handed over to governments, uh, such as the United States and the UK governments, um, in response to a very thin legal process. Uh, procedure had sort of replaced this. Now, there were other parts of the reporting that talked about um, tailored access operations or real estate sponsor hack. Um, and this is analogous to what we see today. But in this previous context, we're talking about specialized top secret units uh, within the National Security Agency, right? Uh, within the GCHQ. Um, and these are really the best of the best uh, government type units in the world from very complex organized uh, states that have virtually unlimited budgets uh, to hire this. Uh, they are using these capabilities largely, not entirely, but largely against other state actors, um, or we would like to believe terrorists, right? Uh, what we have seen, what this story says uh, is what I feel was happening. Now, I used to tell in 2013 in that very first interview, um, what was coming? was turnkey tyranny, right? Uh, this is the idea that all of these capabilities grow, they progress, they advance. Uh, and the only thing that's holding them back is this idea of law, of regulation, that the governments could change at any time. But what happens when proliferation spreads this beyond the hands of governments, right? Uh, and now we have companies around the world, I think four profit enterprises, in places like Israel, with the NSO, as we discussed today, also Candiru, uh, also uh, it used to be called Dupin in France, Sorodium. Uh, the only thing these guys do uh, is basically create uh, the digital end of variants of COVID, 
or, or some other uh, biological infection that dodged the latest vaccine resistances. And then instead of trying to develop protection against them, they sell this to the highest bidder around the globe. Now, uh, as, as you mentioned before, NSO will say, oh, you know, we don't sell this to anybody. We only sell this to governments. It's for investigating criminals. It's for uh, investigating terrorists. It's for life-saving work. But then when you look at the incredible work of uh, Amnesty uh, and, and the forensic work, uh, which has been confirmed by Amnesty, by the way, by Citizen Lab, which is the best of the best operation in the world for this kind of thing, uh, and you look at these findings and you swear to them, you see, these tools are actually being sold to the most autocratic, authoritarian, and aggressive regimes. They're being used against journalists. They're being used against domestic opposition. They're being used against human rights defenders. And it is literally resulting in the deaths and detentions of people who never should have been targeted by these tools. And this leaves us asking, uh, you know, as society, what are we going to do about it? Because I will tell you, as someone who has seen the technology advance, to 2013 and now beyond 2013, uh, this is only going to accelerate if we don't put the brakes on it. Uh, and you might go, oh, you know, these people, uh, they're out there, they're activists, they're significant figures in their society. Well, guess what? If they can do it to everyone, they will. I, I, I would like to talk about, uh, to use your words, how we put the brakes on this. And I think a lot of people in the audience would like a, an engagement on the part of the panel with with what should happen now. But before we do that, I just want to interrogate a bit more what exactly it is that we're dealing with here. I mean, how sophisticated, Ed, do you think Pegasus is as a, as a spy tool? I mean, when you were a contractor at the NSA, would you have thought that countries like Kazakhstan and Rwanda would have <laughs> access to a, a, an instrument, a spy tool that could do this much in terms of surveillance? So this is this is an interesting uh, technical point that I, I think most of the, the broader audience is not familiar. Uh, the capabilities of the Pegasus toolkit, that is, when it's in, installed on your phone, it can do everything. It can turn your camera on, it can pull your photo roll, it can pull your location history, it can pull your bookmarks, look at your browsing history, everything you've written in all of your messengers. That's not new. And that's not actually particularly sophisticated. Uh, crimeware. Uh, sort of toolkits were doing this, you know, a decade ago. What makes Pegasus special and uniquely threatened in the same way that national intelligence services from the, the top level letter service are uniquely threatening is how they get it onto your phone, right? These crimeware toolkits, uh, which is basically all that Pegasus is, it's simply sold to a different customer set, so the claim, uh, is that uh, you had to install Right. Um, the people who are trying to hack your phone had to make you download an app and, and click OK, OK, OK to all the security files or, or something like that. Basically, you had to make a mistake to be hacked. What the NSO group does and their animals in the, what I'm calling the new insecurity industry yeah, is they look for vulnerabilities in the code of the critical infrastructure that underlies uh, sort of all of our mobile devices and incident on desk around the world, uh, where if they send you, for example, on the iPhone, an iMessage that is specially crafted to hack your phone, you don't have to click. You don't have to make a mistake. You won't even know it happened. The phone isn't going to buzz in your pocket. You're not going to see you know, weird code uh, in, in the history. You're not going to see a new contact. There is no indication that it has happened. And then once they find this, think about it as a skeleton, basically break into your device or anyone with the same kind of device as you, then they start selling it off. And we do not allow this in any other industry. We don't allow the proliferation of these kind of aggressive uh, technologies in the context of biological weapons. We don't allow them uh, in chemical weapons. We don't allow them in nuclear weapons, right? Uh, and we have had actual United Nations action uh, to sort of institute uh, defenses and, and limitations on proliferation in precisely these same areas where there are structural vulnerabilities uh, that put all of us at risk, regardless of your language, regardless of your flag, everybody is using the same kind of phones, no matter where you are in the world, right? It's one of two different manufacturers, basically. Uh, and we need to get our hands around that uh, because we are, it doesn't matter whether you're high or low in society. Uh, you have a phone or your family has a phone 
or your uh, associates have a phone, and even if you have, you know, the most secure phone in the world, every conversation exists in two places, the origin and the destination of that communication. So even if your phone isn't, if the people that you're talking to, their phones are off the wall, your communications are still lost, regardless of the phones. Let, let me just ask you this one quick follow-up. I want to bring in Agnes and Steph shortly, but it, uh, I ask you this because um, it is the, the most commonly asked question that was submitted to us before this panel started was about what people can do themselves to protect themselves. I read a blog you wrote overnight, Ed, and you said the first thing you do when you get an iPhone, I'm just pulling this up here, is um, dismantle it effectively and you surgically remove the microphones manually. Yeah, that's when I get a, a smartphone, um, and, and that's true. Not an iPhone, I don't use iPhones. Um, <laughs> okay. Because iPhones yeah. don't allow you to have full control but, over the operating but, system. Uh, my, best but, guess, but, my, best guess is, my best guess is, is a small proportion of people are going to have the technical know-how to get a screwdriver out. And, right. uh, and, exactly. But, so, well, it's but, but what's, just what, what can people do? What is like an easy thing people can do to make themselves a bit safer? Well, this is the thing. You're not Edward Snowden, right? Uh, and, and you don't want to live like that promise you that <laughs> it's it's uh, you know imagine trying to get a new phone uh, and you're just trying to get contacts and board or talk to your friend or whatever and you're like oh god you know i have to remove the adhesive i have to pull out a hot air i have to desolder these micro where are the microphones what do microphones look like i need to get x-rays these uh, systems break them down and look where these things are located uh, you can't do that and you can't expect society at large to do that and that is precisely the problem the only way the public can protect itself. The only way society, international, can protect itself against these kind of uh, extremely well-resourced uh, predators against our infrastructure is to halt the commercial trade uh, in what is effectively intrusion software. Yeah, and we'll come on to whether that's a reasonable ambition, whether we think it could happen, the halt of the trade of, of this kind of malware. Before we do that, Steph, you know, the, the Pegasus project has had reverberations all over the world. Just how do you feel that the reporting, I mean, because you've reported on SO for so long and I've edited many of your stories and, um, and it's, you know, it's the indefatigability of reporters like you that, that makes these stories come out because you, just, you, you keep at it. But what, what's your feeling about you know, how this particular project is resonating in different parts of the world? Sure, I'll start with the most recent um, response that we just reported on today, actually, or overnight, and that is that there was a statement by four Democratic uh, members of Congress, all of whom are pretty influential, um, and including one who represents Silicon Valley, which maybe we should talk about a bit later, because I think that's pretty um, telling. And this letter um, was very critical of NSO, um, even though the U.S. doesn't you know, feature in a huge way um, in our project, although there were some people who were selected um, in the US. But um, it's what's really interesting is that they're calling on the Biden administration to include NSO group, for example, or to consider putting NSO group on the entity list in the Commerce Department, which essentially would put NSO group in the same category as Huawei or Ike Vision, which are considered sort of enemies of the US. So that's a pretty strong statement um, for American members of Congress to be saying that about an Israeli company. Um, they're also calling for sanctions against some of the clients um, who we've named and basically are saying that the US needs to kind of wake up to this threat. Um, it's also interesting because um, we've reported that there were, were you know, that uh, Emmanuel Macron, as well as um, most of his cabinet were selected as candidates. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that they were necessarily hacked, and we've made that very clear in our coverage. Um, you know, that means that a major ally of the U.S. was possibly um, seen as a target by some of by clients of of the NSO and of NSO. And so, it's interesting to note that that is seen uh, as really a threat to possibly to U.S. national security as well. And I think that's what the statement makes clear. Um, in other parts of the world, we've seen some big responses as well. We've seen um, the French government led by Macron call for investigations into this. It's obviously a very big and um, evolving story in France. And I expect that we're going to see more news coming out of Paris on that yeah. front. Um, in Mexico, which was the first client of NSO, um, and where you know our colleague Nina Lacani just reported this 
incredible um, scale of you know possible abuse, um, including uh, the people, you know, dozens of people around the current president being selected um, or being seen as possible uh, people of interest in um, for possible targeting. Uh, so the president over door has called for an end of any remaining NSO um, contracts. And I'll say in India, this story is definitely uh, reverberated with uh, members of opposition, you know, opposition leaders saying that, um, uh, calling uh, the moves that we suspect of, of uh, President Modi, you know, saying that he is uh, um, operating basically a surveillance state. So that's, uh, that's kind of an interesting um, development as well. And Agnes, can I ask, I think in India, there have been talks about booting Amnesty out, right, over your role in the Pegasus project. Do, what do you think is sort of most significant about the revelations? I mean, obviously, you know, Steph mentions Macron and the heads of state and the, the use of Pegasus as a tool of espionage gets a lot of attention. But, you know, a big part of this was actually surveillance of people who are not particularly well known, but do really important work anti-corruption journalists who, who work for civil society in countries where you can be jailed for that kind of thing. You know, wh which aspect of the Pegasus project means most to you? And do you think, do you think from the Amnesty's perspective is the most important? Well, I mean, I think the most um, you know, crucial dimension of the Pegasus project is the scale. Um, the fact that it, um, you know, it, uh, so far, at least we know of uh, 50 something thousand um, people of interest targeted a number of countries, client of NSO, the, the, global, uh, the global spread of the, uh, of the use of the spyware and the fact that we can now move from anecdotal evidence of targeting of um, human rights defenders and journalists to a far more systemic uh, allegation. You know, at, at least 188 journalists have been targeted, and this is only um, based on the number that we have been able to um, to uh, identify and access. And there are many more for which we have no no names. A large number of defenders uh, were targeted. So the unlawful use of, uh, of the spyware against anything that NSO may claim is, is, uh, is very systematic. You know, uh, every, every one of those countries concerned is misusing the spyware, uh, which is why, in my view, we are talking about a weapon. It is a weapon that is meant to um, attack uh, rights to privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of information, it is undermining key democratic principles when it's uh, targeting politicians of the opposition. And it could, and it may be, uh, a threat to peace and security globally, because let's not forget that those um, you know, country uses the spyware to target individuals who are located outside their territories. Uh, you know, if it was any other weapon, it, it will be a, a, you know, a scandal, more than a scandal, a, a real threat. So we need to look at that as a threat uh, globally and as a potential weapon. And, and given you say it should be treated as a weapon, what recourse do we have to regulate this technology? We have, I'm going to talk, talk, turn to some questions here. And before I do, just as a reminder to everyone, if you've got a question for the panel, please use the Q&A facility on Zoom to type in your question and then that will get sent through to me. Um, we, we've got a few questions on this, on this issue. One person um, asks, let me pick this up here. You know, what do you see as the best sort of transnational institutions for affecting change in this space? And I guess Amnesty is, is a transnational institution. And so is the UN where you used to work. Just related to that, if I can add, someone else, Meg asks, um, uh, thank you for the explanations. Which UN agency exactly, if any, has the capacity and mandate to regulate this kind of stuff? Mm. Look, um, first of all, I, I, I want to, um, uh, to comment uh, Edward's uh, comment because it is not something that can be tackled individually. I fully agree with his analysis when people are saying, what can I do to protect myself? Really, what you need to do to protect yourself is protect all of us. 
means pushing, you know, placing a lot of pressure on our government. We're focusing on NSO. We know from 2013 and after that a number of governments are uh, engaging in unlawful surveillance and are engaging and are using spywares, um, uh, you know, uh, extraterritorially. We need to put pressure on our governments first and foremost to put in place a proper legal framework nationally so that this kind of behaviors, whether by the police or by the intelligence services, is well regulated domestically. That begins there. And then the next step, and most countries do not have that framework, by the way, then the next step is to go for the moratorium, which is what Amnesty and others have called for, an international moratorium over the, um, the use and export and sell of that spyware. That is going to be a, a complex process, but we need to put pressure on it. There is no, um, in, there is no country at the moment or governments, I will suspect, that is prepared to take the lead on that. I hope we can find a few. Um, it is really up to civil society and individuals' pressure. That needs to, um, that needs to trigger an action yeah. on the part of governments internationally. But if we could already have a good framework domestically, that will be yeah. a first step, including yeah. in Israel, including yeah. in Israel. That, that, that would be a big step in Israel. A big portion of its economy, as you know, relies on this cyber industry. Um, Ed, what, what you've said to me in the past, this is an industry that should not exist. So how, how do you go about making an industry like this not existing? I think we need to look at uh, what this industry is and, and how it came to be. Again, this is a hacking for hire industry. It is their only product. That is the only value that they offer. Uh, all of the uh, sort of excuses uh, that the NSO group has put up to, to try to like wave away this massive scandal that they've been involved in, it's like, oh, you know, these are uh, HLR lookups, uh, which are still spying adjacent. There is not really a legitimate uh, purpose for the collection, for the gathering, for the querying of this kind of information about these kinds of people, uh, except to violate their privacy, except to monitor them, except to see where their phone numbers are registered, uh, whether their devices are act, uh, active on the network, so that uh, you can start pitching exits at them, so that you can try to get into the phone. Um, so again, how do you start to shut them down? Well, how do they get to this scale? How did you get uh, this random Israeli company uh, run by people who are not technical experts by any stretch of the imagination? What distinguishes them from those crimeware authors who were selling the same kinds of toolkits for things like ransomware that have now taken over the world? Uh, well, through global capital flows. Uh, they got venture capital backing from a major US uh, venture capital firm, uh, Francisco Partners. That stake got bought out by a EU company, uh, Noval Peanut Capital, right? Um, and if these kinds of investments were prohibited because of the involvement in what is essentially a criminal trade, well, suddenly you start choking off the capital flows to these companies. You start choking off the markets that make this kind of tool with this level of sophistication possible. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly, you don't have Apple trying to defend against billion dollar companies. Uh, but they're trying to defend against the same kind of uh, low-level hackers, disorganized with limited resources that they always have. Now, um, again, when we talk about a moratorium, when we talk about um, prohibiting the commercial trade, and perhaps, in my opinion, uh, imposing some kind of criminal liability for involved in this trade, people go, oh, well, Israel won't play ball, right? Because it's not in their interest. Well, it doesn't matter. When the companies are open uh, about their sort of business, they go to uh, sort of a, sort of arms conferences uh, where you know they sell tanks, they sell police gear, they sell surveillance gear like this. Uh, and guess what? They happen all over the world. Suddenly, if these people are wanted for civil or criminal liability in the EU or in the United States, it doesn't matter that their activity originated in Israel. Now you start to limit uh, the movement of capital, you start to limit the movement of personnel, uh, and the trade begins to move back into the shadows. And people will go, well, it still exists in some corner of the internet. It still exists in Azerbaijan, but that is an improvement. 
on the status quo that we need to move forward. I guess the question would then be, how, how do we get to a position of that kind of reform, whether it's on a domestic level or you have international treaties that form offer some form of regulation? There's a question from Yanis Evangelou. You may not like it, uh, Ed Snowden, but she says, in my opinion, the majority of the world is passive about secret surveillance, uninterested and uninspired to even bother doing anything about it. So, so what do you think the underlying reason is for this? And how can people's perceptions be really changed? And I think the extension of that is you need to change people's perception for there to be the kind of public appetite necessary to make these legislative changes that you're talking about. Well, this is why exactly why the Pegasus project was so important, so impactful. And I said, you know, this is likely to be the story of the year. And if not, honestly, it's a disservice to the public because exactly that is actually true, um, not uniformly, but to a large extent. We saw this previously in the case of 2013, uh, where when the mass surveillance scandal happened, um, Germany was like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And then suddenly there's a story in Der Spiegel that says Angela Merkel and you know all of her friends are being spied on personally. And then Germany's up in arms, right? The German government did not care at all about the rights of millions of Germans. But when the rights of a few German ministers are violated, it's a scandal. The same thing in the Pegasus Project, right? People don't care until they realize it affects them. Well, guess what? This does affect. It affects you if you're in government, it affects you if you're out of government. These are devices that everybody depends on. You can't not use these. You can't you know, pull microphones out of every device. You don't know how to do it, right? Uh, it, it's not correct, it's not accurate, and it's more. Even if they can't hear you, they can still see where the device is moving. They can still see who you're talking to, You know, all of these different things. We have created international organizations and conventions in the past to deal with this. Uh, you know, we have the Chemical Weapons Convention with the Organization uh, for the Prohibition on Chemical Weapons. Uh, we have, uh, you know, UN Convention's disarmament. Uh, and we have models here. We don't need to pretend this is something extraordinary. This is something exceptional uh, simply because it's not a physical object, right? Um, your life online is your life off. Uh, they're two parts of the same whole. And just because uh, violations are happening in the digital space doesn't make them any less serious. In fact, because of their reach, because of their involvement in this, and especially because of their invisibility, there's a very strong uh, that these violations are more impactful and more dangerous to societies. Mm. Let, let, let me ask Steph a sim similar question to this, which is, going back to let me see who asked this question because i didn't mention them francis maxwell who asked a question about transnational institutions affecting change are there others steph that we've not mentioned that could be you know used as leverage to bring about some kind of reform do you think uh yeah i mean as much as um and i see ed's point and i think uh the point that Agnes made as well about accountability is going to be really critical here and what we haven't seen so far are you know are criminal charges against anyone who's affiliated with this or any real personal accountability. Um, you know, I think there's a real possibility that the US government could take a strong stance against um, attempts to or hacking of American citizens, for example. But I think one of the elements we haven't discussed so far, and I'll, I, I'm not sure what Ed would say to this, but we do see um, big US companies starting to weigh in in a really serious way. I mentioned that Anna Eshoo, um, the Congresswoman was one of the four who represents Silicon Valley was one of the four who signed on that statement that was quite strong um, last night here in Washington. Uh, we obviously see that WhatsApp, um, the messaging app has taken the lead on um, pursuing NSO in court. They're suing, um, they're suing them in California following the disclosure of that 1400 of their own users were attacked uh, using Pegasus um, in 2019. Uh, and it looked like WhatsApp was a bit lonely there for a while and not many companies were getting involved. Uh, as, the, as that case progressed, however, we saw other major companies kind of joining in, supporting WhatsApp. Uh, I'm talking about Microsoft, Google, Cisco. Um, I think the big question for us, and we've talked a lot about this, Paul, is what are we going to see Apple do? Because there's an awful lot of stories that have now been written in the last week saying your um, iPhone is not safe. It's not safe um, from the latest, uh, your latest iPhone and your latest operating system is not safe from Pegasus. So, you know, what, 
I think that Apple has a stake in this fight, yeah. um, and so do all these other companies. And for many of them, we're seeing them seeing them weigh in. Um, yeah. So I, I think, think I think in terms of creating political pressure, which is so critical in the U.S. and around the world, that's where um, that's where NSO and Israel, to some extent, might face some major issues. Yeah. I mean, Apple's stock obviously took a dip in the early days after the Pegasus project launched, but and you can understand why it's just a bad news story for Apple. And the reason we know NSO went after Apple technology is once you have an exploit in Apple, you, you can potentially get into any Apple phone uh, which uses iOS. But, but tell us, Steph, what, what, you know, why do you think you know, Facebook owned WhatsApp, you know, Microsoft, Google, why do you think these big companies sort of care as much as they seem to? Um, about this particular issue? Like, what, what, what is it for them? Do they, are they worried about their users? Are they worried about PR? Do they think people might migrate to different technologies? Well, I think it's because this uh, spyware means that their products are not safe. I think, it's pretty, I think it's pretty straightforward. And I think, I mean, I'm sure some of them talk about it being, you know, a broader threat to cybersecurity. But the fact is, it's not, I mean, uh, do I think that they're going to have the same stance against a Raytheon, for example? that makes you know, certain kinds of technology or other US companies that make technology where we haven't seen stories about this kind of abuse. I'm not sure, but um, I do think that NSO is a very special case. And, and, and actually we saw recently with Microsoft take on another Israeli company. So I think that there is a sense of frustration and anger that this technology has not been regulated um, globally or specifically by Israel, and that it's gotten into the hands of, of people who are you, who are abusing it, um, and and in a way that just goes against the you know the way it's supposed to be used. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I think the, the the direction of travel of this conversation is really interesting because we're starting to talk about you know basically what what can be done here to to change things. But I want to take a a, a, a brief pause from that to ask a question. This is a slightly indulgent question, Steph, but it comes from Hannah who asks. Um, uh, I have a question for Stephanie. As a journalist, what was it like to break this story? Well, Paul can answer that as well, since <laughs> Paul and I were working, and, and Agnes as well, we were working um, really nonstop. It was a really exciting um, project to be part of. It was um, actually um, our colleague, Michael Safi. And, and his team did a, a five part podcast, which I would highly recommend, we're all on it. Um, and talking about the kind of behind the scenes of breaking this, this story. I have to say, um, I think it's, I think we're just starting. I think there's a lot more um, that will like eventually come out. And um, so this is, I think, just the start of a much bigger, uh, you know, more stories coming and, and about this very important issue, but it, it was exhilarating and exhausting, I would say, and I don't know if Paul would agree. Yeah, we're all still feeling quite exhausted, I think. Um, uh, Anya, there's lots of people asking questions I can see um, uh, about, uh, wanting to know a bit more about what, what the Pegasus project showed from like a human rights perspective. Someone was asking, um, uh, it's Sam, whether this is this was, was exclusively used by right-wing authoritarian governments, as in NSO groups, technology, or is it is it more nuanced than that? What does the Pegasus project tell us about the types of um, companies that the that, that, uh, countries, sorry, that are using NSO spyware? Well, I mean, I think um, you know, among the the twelve or so countries that have been identified, there is a broad range of. Um, um, of, you know, characteristics, some of them are nominal democracy, at least, uh, such as India, Mexico, Hungary, others are more well known to be associated with repression, such as Saudi Arabia, UAE, Morocco, um, Azerbaijan, and so on. So it, it's, a, it's a mixed, uh, mixed bag. And, um, you know, what, what it shows is that um, you, you don't really have uh, you know, a, a personality when it comes to the client. It is, I will suspect, any countries that can afford um, to buy and purchase a spyware and that does not have the capacity to, to create it itself. 
you know mm. that uh, so that 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 i think is uh, is is a bottom line anyone really and i'm not talking you know i'm only talking here about um about government i think i want to repeat what i've said earlier it is systematic and it is global mm. when when nso say that they are selective about the countries they sell this spyware to. They recently, if anyone's interested, put out a transparency report in which they said they actually have um, you know, a process in which they give a human rights score to prospective clients, um, you know, considering like things like the Freedom Index or Transparency International and how free or democratic these countries are before they give them such a powerful tool. Now, what, 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 as someone who's been working on human rights, Agnes, for a long time, what's your assessment of the human rights standards of, say, Bahrain or the UAE or uh, Azerbaijan or Morocco? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, or Saudi Arabia. Uh, or Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's, it's just, um, you know, it, it's just quite ridiculous to, um, to, to suggest that uh, their due diligence process is, um, uh, is fit for purpose. First and foremost, we at Amnesty International, but others as well, have already denounced the use of the Pegasus by a number of countries. Let's take Morocco. You know, um, Amnesty has denounced uh, several years ago the fact that journalists were targeted by the Moroccan government using the spyware. The implication of those allegations should have been that NSO should refrain from selling uh, that tool. Yet they continue to do so. Um, and that is not the, uh, the only example, um, you know, the UAE uh, and Saudi Arabia to, to name just a few. So that's the first thing. They do not act on findings um, and the evidence that has been provided. Let's look at other countries, maybe countries where they have never sell we uh, this weapon, such as Azerbaijan. Look. You know, any kind of uh, very uh, quick research into Azerbaijan track record will lead uh, a conscientious organization to conclude that they should not be selling uh, the spyware to, to such a country, and yet they did so. So uh, in, our, in Amnesty's opinion, in Amnesty's analysis, actually NSO uh, did more than fail to meet its due diligence obligation. It is actually complicit, according to the international standard regarding corporate complicity. We have no doubt that NSO is complicit in the human rights violations by those states. Why? Because the company's conduct, in that case, selling and uh, giving services around the spyware, that conduct facilitated the violation. That's the first criteria. And the second is that NSO knew or should have known that it would be misused. These are the definition of corporate complicity under international standards. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm um, yeah. I, it's almost, um, read, you know, laughable that um, NSO could make the claims that it is making at the moment regarding um, its, uh, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know, come on. Yeah. Um, I probably share your skepticism, but I'm not allowed to have an opinion because I'm a reporter. Um, uh, but I can be skeptical, as can Steph. Um, uh, we've gotten some interesting comments if I'm looking at the threads, and, and I think Ed, this is probably quite common when it comes to issues of surveillance. You know, one person, Neville Williams, says, why should the average member of the public worry about the intrusion you're investigating? And then someone else ever says, you know, this is incredibly scary and uncomfortable uh, to learn about and are, are our lives and the whole way of life in danger? How, how should people sort of measure and sort of quantify, uh, categorize um, this disclosure? I and mean, what does it mean for them now? And what could it potentially mean for our lives in the years ahead? Sorry, I don't know if that question was, was for me, but it, 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 was, it was addressed for you and it would be great. Yeah, I mean, but anyone okay. can jump yeah. in, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, when you hear that Emmanuel Macron is on the targeting uh, list for some kind of spy, uh, the French official body is, of course, going to be a thousand. Um, I don't think uh, 
uh, I expect Macron to be targeted uh, by everyone. Um, I think they're going to make promises. I think they're going to break promises. And honestly, this is the fault of France, the United States, and Germany for not taking uh, just reoccurring again and again and again platforms and opportunities to limit uh, not only the uh, sort of spread and acceptability of these new forms of espionage, but the capability, right, of these systems. Uh, these states are all incentivized. Uh, the increase in the acceleration of their offensive capabilities uh, at the expense of their defense capabilities. Uh, it would be very easy for any one of these governments and all of these governments to say, look, if a vulnerability is found, you're a researcher, you're an academic, you're any, um, you have an obligation to report this uh, to the manufacturer of the software, right? The, the maker of that, so it can be closed. But if the company doesn't respond to it, suddenly liability is on them. We can impose penalties to make sure that they begin securing uh, their software. But if you sell it, right, the liability is on you. If you, the NSO group, sell this to, the first example, the government of Mexico, uh, and because of corruption or because of a policy choice, they use this to hack the phone of a journalist, which we believe could very well have happened. And then he's murdered as he's waiting at par. Uh, that is on not, you know, some shadowy figure that we can't identify, but on everybody who had a fingerprint on that booth on the way there. It's the government. It's the NSO group. It's the developer at the NSO group who wrote the exploit and did not report this to evidence, the people who discovered the movie, right? We need academic exceptions. We need research exceptions. But you go, you know, why do people care? Um, why should you care? Because it can, if it can happen to them, it can happen to you. And what we're seeing is the leading edge of an industry uh, that is growing rapidly and frighteningly, but it's still very much in its infancy. Uh, and we have a choice here whether to smother it in the crib or not. Uh, and I think we very much should, because we have to ask ourselves, what is the regulatory alternative here? You know, one of the cute things the NSO group likes to do is they go, oh, we need to do this. These are necessary tools, which is, by the way, false. We have older traditional means for investigation. Uh, we have domestically produced uh, tools for investigation in every country in the world. And guess what? They work and they have worked and they will work tomorrow. And you don't even have to hack a smartphone to break one of these gangs. Uh, police have had 100 years uh, to figure out and develop ways to monitor people when they're in their cars, when they're at their workplace, when they're at a cafe, when they're coordinating uh, with everyone else, and it's effective. But look, so we talk about regulations. There's people like you know the Washington Post uh, who have uh, sort of a weak tea suggestion for how we regulate these things. By the way, a lot of people are afraid to suggest regulations for two problems. One, because it involves countries like Israel, and people, politicians especially, are afraid of criticizing. Um, two, because it involves countries like Saudi Arabia, which they are also afraid to criticize. And by the way, I have to give a tremendous respect to you guys, uh, for really pushing to enforce accountability for the Khashoggi killing uh, when everybody else was trying to let this go away. Uh, and this is the thing. All of these people, all of these processes, uh, Israel, for example, goes, well, we go above and beyond. We realize this is a serious thing. We realize there are serious consequences if it gets out of control. So we've got soft regulations. We've tried hard regulations. We've got export controls and export licenses in the same way that we sell missiles. Right? This is software. It's not a missile. This should be enough. We tried that, and it failed. And we have the body count to prove it. See, the thing is, these aren't missiles. They are worth in a very particular way. Uh, because the thing is, when a missile is fired, it makes the news. There is uh, undeniable evidence that's left behind. There's charred earth, there's an explosion, and then imposes hit points for investigation and accountability. This is like a poison gas that more often than not leaves behind no trace. And this makes Saudi Arabia and Azerbaijan and all these companies that previously did not have the complexity and organization and sophistication to create these tools and tools, uh, to can acting with them around the world, and you can't prove that it happened. So now, how then do we impose accountability? 
The way to do this is to limit access to limit use, and ultimately that means limiting production. Um, I, I would like to spend the last six or seven minutes that we've got on this just talking to you and Agnes about what, what people here who want to do something to try to change this can do themselves on a practical level. But before that, I know that my colleague Steph um, has to vanish very soon because we're running over. But Steph, before you go, there is, there's, a, there's another sort of media indulgent question there. I, um, I can't resist asking this. There's two actually. Um, so one person says, Michael says, this is a massive story, but why has it been completely ignored by the BBC and other news outlets? Um, uh, it is true that it hasn't had a huge amount to pick up in the UK compared to elsewhere in the world. Um, and another person asked, Lauren asked, as a journalist, do you feel safe breaking a story like this? Well, to answer the first question, I'm, I'm sitting here in my attic in Washington, DC. So it's a little bit hard for, although I did used to be a media reporter um, in London. So what I would say to that is I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sitting in those BBC um, news meetings, but um, if they're not covering the story, then they're obviously missing a big story because what we've reported and my colleagues and reported is that there were many, many, many uh, British uh, numbers who were selected as candidates for possible surveillance. And if they, you know, any other paper of, of uh, involved in the Pegasus project, they'll they'll read all about them. Um, actually, on Friday, I also reported that um, NSO in 2019, even as the investors that um, Ed talked about at length were uh, promising that they were going to be taking human rights seriously, they were kind of hatching this deal to allow Dubai to uh, target. British phone numbers, um, and that was a new capability. So there was a, a decision to expand the geography of where Dubai could target, you know, um, target this weapon. And they allowed Dubai to go ahead and target the UK. So I think that's a pretty big story for the BBC to uh, try to follow up on. Um, I think the question was how we feel as reporters. Um, yeah, I mean, are, are you are you um, safe breaking a story like this? Is it was the question? Do you feel safe? Um, when I started writing about surveillance technology, I was um, it put me really on edge. I'll admit it did uh, concern me, especially when I was writing about Saudi Arabia. Um, I'll tell you the fact that NSO says it does not target US phones does not make me safe, feel safe. Uh, that does not put me at ease. But I would say we are as careful as we can be. Um, and we are especially careful with our sources and people who, um, you know, uh, put themselves at risk to share information that's this critical. And uh, yeah, we do what we can. Okay, well, thank you, Steph. And we, we are going to stay here for another five minutes. I know you have to go, but um, I'm sure the audience will appreciate uh, a bit more time just to hear from Agnes and Ed about what happens next. Um, so, I mean, we've talked in sort of broad brush terms, Agnes, you talked about, you know, the need for domestic legislation, and then subsequent to that, maybe some international movement. But, but someone watching this now, and they want to do something, what can they do to help? Um, you know, I, I think Ed has already mentioned it at, um, at uh, you know, within countries or internationally, I think we need to really move uh, to hold NSO to account and the governments that have used um, that, um, that weapon. So uh, it is incumbent upon us, it is incumbent upon the victims, it is incumbent upon uh, whether they are politicians, whether they are journalists, human rights defenders, families, um, to, um, to, to, to file um, you know, for proceeding, to go to court. This is what's happening in, in, in a few countries. I would hope that whoever has been targeted, and there are quite a lot of them, that please, please bring a case to, uh, to your country. That, to me, is, uh, is going to be an important step, and it will be signaling to all those actors that, um, you know, they, they, they just cannot do that without some price to pay. We need, we need a price to be paid. So that begins with, uh, with legal proceeding, whether it's criminal or civil. I've already mentioned the need for domestic framework, domestic legal framework to curtail surveillance. I noticed uh, a lot of people in the chat are uh, 
you know, pointing to the fact that LSO is not the only actor. Of course, it's not. That is why uh, we also need to acknowledge that governments which have that technology must be um, must be brought in, must be reined in, in the same way that the corporate sector needs to be. Uh, domestic framework is uh, is very important. Uh, Edward has already mentioned. The, the financial linkages, the role of the investors, the role of those companies that are putting money in NSO, insurance companies have invested a great deal in that, uh, in that technology. They need to be held to account. We need to hold them to account for investing into companies that are misbehaving in that fashion. And then we need to put pressure for the moratorium. Uh, that needs to be done at the um, UN level, but maybe at the European level, we have more chances to initiate such a process. If I can just jump in on that, I, I want to be clear from, from my perspective uh, that, yeah, it would be great if we had global agreement on this. It would be great if we had UN participation. It is not necessary, um, and we should not pretend that it is. Uh, if we have one major jurisdiction, if we have not even the entire EU, uh, but a major EU member state like Germany and France, uh, or especially the United States, um, pass a regulation that has strong extradition agreements around the world for financial influence, as the US does with uh, banks all around the world where they can, again, freezing assets, no bank in the world wants to mess with the US government. Um, that's good enough to buy us the kind of time we need. The point of the moratorium that isn't to solve the problem. That doesn't make it go away. That buys us time. That gives us space to begin actually looking at how do we impose the accountability and consequences needed to remove or at least balance the commercial incentive as it currently exists. None of these companies are doing this to save the world. They're doing it to get rich. And that's what we need to fix. Because if we fix that, the world gets a lot safer overnight. And and, and last question, Eddie. Your 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 uh tuning in from Moscow. Uh, Steph, before she left, was Washington. And yes, I believe you're in the south of France right now. I'm here in London. I mean, I'm sure we have viewers from all over the world, but, but many of them will be here in the U European Union. How important is the EU, do you think, as a potential lever of change here? I mean, for me, I, I think it's proof. I think the EU has become kind of, uh, <laughs> we're dependent on it uh, as the moral center of global policy. Uh, some people might roll their eyes at it, but, you know, the question is, point out who else is good, right? Um, traditionally, we would look to the United States there, um, but the United States has been a burning dumpster for the context of foreign policy for the last 20 years. Uh, and so it, it's really a question of, you know, how else can we do this, if not? Yeah, I, I see you're nodding there. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. When it comes to um, the... the technology and when it comes to the right to privacy, which is a trigger for regulation, which has been a trigger for regulation, there is far more that can be done through, uh, through the European system than uh, through the United States. And uh, they have taken steps already. So let's hope, as uh, Ed uh, said, that uh, there will be the moral camp compass on, on that particular question. Yeah. And um, look, for those of you who are watching who are luckily lucky enough to still live in the EU, then you know who to write to in terms of your uh, member of the European Parliament. For those who are not in the EU, uh, I, I, I mourn the moment. Um, I have to say this because I, I don't see it recorded. Uh, basically, one of the primary defenses by the user, which was mentioned by Stephanie earlier, um, was they say, we're not going to target uh, countries' phone numbers uh, that are, you know, particularly influential to get them off of here, basically. We're not going to target UK numbers, and we're not going to target US numbers or whatever. That is fundamentally unwarranted from any number. Any kind of target pro targeting prohibition that's baked into malware, uh, whether it's done with the best or the worst of intentions, is unreliable. And we have seen this for years, no less than the US National Security Agency. Uh, which has similar kinds of prohibition where uh, the malware toolkit is supposed to self-destruct if it's in the wrong country, uh, have been stolen and spread around the world. It has been co-opted and reused in ransomware attacks that would not have been possible had they reportedly closed this one building years earlier. Now we have a commercial uh, industry that's saying, trust us, we've got controls on this and it will be used against you. Uh, 
But the whole thing is at the bottom, the end of the day, the NSO group, by their own words, says we can't control who this is targeted against specifically. We say you can't enter a US phone number to pitch the exploit of that phone. OK, fine. But what if they target a phone number in Moran? If they control, where they specially staged a carefully prepared forensic device in the same way that uh, Amnesty International Citizen Lab would use this, but they're not trying to catch evidence the device was infected. They're trying to observe and replicate the infection vector itself. Just in the context of using a biological weapon, right? Where if you get a sample of the virus, you can then clone it. You can then modify it. You can then reuse it and repurpose it against anyone you want. Digital infection vectors work the same way. If you can identify the vulnerability that the NSO group uh, uses to get in, even if you're a customer, even if you're Saudi Arabia, you say you no longer want Israel telling you who you can and can't target. You can steal that X, and then you can reuse it against anyone in the world, you, whether it's McCollum, whether it's Biden, it's Mother Teresa, you're the best person on earth, the worst person on earth. No one can stop you, and that should converse. Excuse me, and that should concern us. Thank you. That's a that's a chilling thought to end on, Ed. And um, uh, I want to just finish by saying thank you to you, thank you to Agnes, thank you to Steph for joining us, um, and thank you for the audience too. Uh, we normally have a survey that pops up on your screen. Um, given we've done this via Zoom instead of our standard platform, I don't know if that's going to pop up, but we do appreciate your feedback. So if anyone's got thoughts or questions or suggestions on how we might do these things differently, please let us know. And lastly, um, I should say, we always like to say on these things that, that, that thank you for supporting The Guardian's journalism. Um, and if anyone here would like to make a further contribution to what we do, our independent journalism, you can do that very easily by support.theguardian.com forward slash contribute. Um, I know that a lot of people already do support us and um, you know we can only do what we do because of the support of our readers. So we really appreciate that. and. Um, we hope to see more projects like the Pegasus project in the future. So um, with that, I will say thank you. We'll, we'll bring this to an end and hope to see everyone again at another event soon. Thank you.